Hello and welcome to the NDTV Dialogues, a conversation of ideas. This week, we focus on the right to die. The death of Aruna after 42 years in what was described as a permanent vegetative state once again brought India's attention to the larger issue of euthanasia. In fact, for the first time, passive euthanasia was allowed in India under certain strict regulations because of her story. Was her death the end of a life sentence, as some have put it, or an affirmation of a right to life? Whatever the outside world's perception may be, the jury is out on who finally decides. Joining me on the NTV Dialogues to debate this is Justice Gyan Sudha Mishra, the judge who, along with Justice Kapchu, gave that landmark judgment. The issue is now, of course, being discussed with a, uh, by a constitution bench as well. Also with me, Pinky Virani, biographer. She wrote the Aruna story and was the petitioner as the next friend in the Aruna case. Also with me is Dr. Bunny, well-known medical specialist who has worked on end-of-life issues and what exactly that means. I'm also joined by Harmala Gupta of Can Support, who works with critically ill patients and their families. Thank you all very much for joining me. Justice Mishra, was the Aruna case one of the most difficult cases of your career? In a sense, it opened the doors to passive euthanasia, but was very clear on where that door must shut. What did you feel when you heard this case and when you delivered that judgment? Uh, I think you are absolutely correct that this was one of the most difficult case of my career because one of the prime reason was that I didn't feel an expert on the subject. In one of the ordinary cases, you feel that you know a lot. But on euthanasia, I felt that I'm totally blank and I was not really able to reconcile how I'm going to decide it singly. But thanks to the cooperation of uh, the lawyers, the medical fraternity, and of course, Justice Karju, and all those who assisted us, uh, I think that because by dint of their cooperation, we were able to do whatever little bit we could do uh, for the issue that was raised uh, by Ms. Pinky Virani. We hailed her effort. We, uh, in fact, if she had not raised the issue, we would not even have arrived regarding the upholding of passive euthanasia because there was no legislation, mm -hmm. there was not much of literature. It was all, everything was in a fluid state. It was just without boundaries. So it was very difficult to, uh, to decide a matter and especially because of its implication uh, because it had both legal and moral aspects. Ironically, because as I said, the Aruna story focused on the need for perhaps euthanasia. There was a verdict, yet you didn't consider her case a fit one for it. You see, uh, speaking for myself, I felt that, you know, it's just not a case of a single individual. It had implications on other uh, cases which could crop up in future. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, my concern was that uh, the first uh, issue would be whether it should at all be allowed. And then we bifurcated active euthanasia and passive euthanasia. And the second most important thing was that if at all we permit it, then who should be given the right to raise the issue and take a decision in this regard. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first reaction, initial reaction on that was that uh, can a third party, in spite of his or her best intentions can be given the right to take up the issue. Because as I said, the first thing is whether it should at all be permitted. And if it is permitted, then who should have the right? And uh, we had put a straightforward uh, query to the councils who were appearing that please enlighten us about the theory of locus standi. Yes, and, so that, and in fact, then the, the judgment lays down very strict regulations, including yes. Uh, yes. High Court has to approve it and the doctors, yes, bench, yes. Uh, doctors have to be appointed. But Pinky Virani, perhaps not just about the individual case, but she became the face of the euthanasia battle, uh, a case which is uh, a battle which is still continuing after her death in a sense. Why do you think it's important that perhaps we go a step further than what the judgment said? Or what do you see as passive euthanasia? Because there was also debate whether actually stopping food to Aruna was in a sense active euthanasia, not passive. Uh, first things first, Sonia, thank you for making the distinction between 
active euthanasia and passive euthanasia exactly the way in which this complete landmark judgment has done so. And I have thanked the justices in the past and I'm happy that one of them is sitting in the studio now so I can do it again. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And at the bottom of my heart also sits my Aruna. So thank you from both of us. I think if one reads the judgment, which was then law, and which has been endorsed by the government of India in the Rajya Sabha last year, which means in effect, passive euthanasia is law in India until mm -hmm. government decides otherwise or Supreme Court decides otherwise. The beauty of the judgment and the way it is drafted is that it clearly makes the difference between life and quality of life. It understands that there is death and it understands that there is dignity. Look, we are all going to die whether we like it or not. So it makes this very great distinction but and yet very subtly between dying and dying with dignity. And when they also make the distinction between passive and active, and there are a lot of pages in that judgment making the distinction, yes. it very clearly defines that passive euthanasia is when death has already set in. And when uh, the two justices spent quite a lot of time understanding persistent vegetative state, they did something that was unimaginable before the judgment law. They actually brought PVS into the medical lexicon, yes, which was really never discussed before in public in India. So it actually was a now, now, you said landmark for some sorry to answer the second part of your question. Those in PVS have a feed, a Ryles tube or any sort of tube. And the feed is tapered out as per international specifications over 15, 20 days. As was the case of Terry Shavo in mm -hmm. America some time back. So it comes under passive euthanasia and it is not as unfortunately as was understood, you know, by the lay public at that time, bhuka marde kya. There was no bhuka marde. It was going to be over 15, 20 days. The feed would be tapered down, some medicines would be added. It would be a really a palliative sense of 15, 20 days where she would finally or any patient finally gets sleep. Ag agree to, of course, sir, Pinky, the, I think one I of the arguments against that was the fact that the I doctors. Agree. Yes, no, I agree with that. But what was interesting was how much the doctors and the nurses in this case at KM Hospital actually fought against doing that. So I think that's perhaps why that misinterpretation came in. But uh, Dr. Mani, if you could come in, the fact that the Terry Shavo case referred to was such a flashpoint in the US as well shows that around the world, this is something which there are no easy answers to when we talk about the right to live with dignity at a time when we see life uh, being prolonged more and more, people living longer, but yet serious disease setting in or in an instance like this where a young woman is uh, put into a uh, permanent vegetative state. The questions about who decides, Dr. Atul Gawande's recent book also makes that point that what are we talking about care now, is it just about prolonging life or the quality of? Where do you weigh in on that? Because you feel, I think, that the judgment didn't go far enough. Yes. Why do you think that? You know, I think, uh, see, medical science in India has evolved greatly. Mm -hmm. Now we are able to save lives, which we couldn't imagine 10 years ago. And I think the technology gap and expertise gap has narrowed a lot in the interventional and treatment aspect. Mm -hmm. But in the ethical and these uh, aspects of quality of dying and how to manage technology, how to set limits for technology, we are at least 40 years behind. Every time we use euthanasia, we think we are killing. Whereas when in a dying patient, where to set the limits, what goals to set, they don't come into the ambit of euthanasia at all. I think the judgment did not take into account all those cases, landmark judgments that started in the US, there have been many in Europe, many in Australia of a similar kind, none of them have labeled this as a euthanasia. Because euthanasia definition is very clear. You know, you have definitions of homicide, culpable homicide, not amounting to murder, you are nuancing all that, all that. But whereas different situations, in this limitation of life support or treatment, you are lumping everything into euthanasia, which is incorrect.
So the decision, for instance, to put a patient in a ventilator or not? Yes. If you know, you I wanted to say, euthanasia has a very narrow definition. Mm -hmm. and therefore, the, the terms of reference that Pinky Virani gave was very narrow, whether we can do euthanasia or not. But there are plenty of other things we can do. Euthanasia means injecting a lethal dose at the request of a patient as an act of mercy. This is the definition. And euthanasia is practiced only in a very, very few areas in the world. It's practiced in the Netherlands, in Denmark, in Switzerland, in the state of Oregon. That's all. Every other area in the civilized world is not practicing euthanasia. So we don't want euthanasia. Doctors don't want euthanasia. But we want quality of death. And we want to be able to set goals for the patient according to the phase of illness. It doesn't make sense. For example, to put Aruna Shonbo on the ventilator at the time of her dying, three days before. This has come out of a lack of understanding of what is the need in a given situation. And why did doctors rage again all this? Because in our, neither in our society nor in the professional circles there has, no, there has been enough debate about it. That's it's not correct to say yes. that there is paucity of literature on the subject in this country. Because the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine wrote the first guidelines on this. No, but that's an interesting point where I just wanted to bring Harmala Gupta in on that specific point that because it's not clear what the medical guidelines are, what the medical ethics are, or even for a family, for a family when I made that point about whether to put someone on a ventilator or not, that we have to do everything possible to keep the patient alive. As somebody who works with patients really in the last stages of their life, very young patients in some points, uh, children, what do you see as a perspective of a caregiver, somebody who's uh, in the field of palliative care as well? See, I think we have to understand that uh, the person who is sick, who is dying, is someone who is greatly loved, that there are emotions that are running high, and that uh, people want to do what they can do to prolong this life. I think there's such a need now for counseling, for uh, uh, doctors, caregivers, patients to sit down, to talk about what's happening, uh, to um, give information so that people can take those decisions for themselves. And to also find out, as you refer to Dr. Gawande's book, what kind of life is the patient looking forward to now? It just can't be about technology. It's also about this person. How would they like their life to be from this moment on? And as he said, his, his father didn't want to take those uh, very toxic treatments because he still wanted to be able to do the things he loved to do, and which he wouldn't be able to do. So it's, it's a question of uh, people understanding each other. As I was saying, you know, it's, it's an art. Medicine is an art. Uh, there are no easy answers. But you probe, you try to find out what is important to this person. And the patient also, or the caregivers, should know when to push, when to retreat. Suppose it's the case of a young child, or it's the case of someone like Aruna who, couldn't, who can't give consent. What do you think should be the way forward then? Well, of course, you see, uh, that's the reason why the living uh, will is now coming into so much prominence. That you should, when you're of so-called sound mind, write your wishes or express your wishes. But it's possible that you may have even discussed these situations. Uh, and it would be the nearest, the next of kin, who would have to take these decisions. which And they too need some guidance. They need some support. They need to understand. We can't be a substitute for the doctor's knowledge and the doctor's experience, mm -hmm. as well as the fact that many of the decisions are based on evidence to which we are not privy. You know, So uh, if, I think that's important. But having said that, I would like to tell you that studies have shown that the next of kin don't necessarily know what this person would have wanted either. Mm -hmm. They have done studies where they found quite a divergence between well, what the patient would have wanted and what the next of kin believe the patient wants. Well, not in our case, of course, the next of kin, exactly, because the next of kin were not in touch with her in that sense. But just no, Sonia, as, I, want to, I uh, just want to bring Justice something. Mishra on, the, on yeah. the, this aspect, because we have seen Justice Mishra, and this has gone to court, that many parents have appealed for instance, when the, uh, in Udaipur there was a case where the two children were paralyzed, so the parents' uh, daily wages went to court saying, please give euthanasia to our children because we can't look after them. So in a country like India, you have a situation where social factors, poverty is actually complicating the issue where parents are approaching court saying we want to kill our children. How does a court then deal with this issue? Just saying that no, you can't do it without providing some kind of recourse to either social welfare or some way to improve their lives doesn't seem to actually help at all. Uh, 
actually I wanted to share some of my personal uh, experience. I, it's quite an irony that I had, I was on the bench deciding the issue of euthanasia uh, several years ago mm -hmm. and I never knew that I would be confronted with a situation of this nature in my personal life. Mm. And now what I'm saying is my personal reaction because I didn't want to share it on from the public platform, but I tell you my first hand experience. I lost my husband a year, year ago. He suffered a hemorrhage, brain hemorrhage, and he was on the ventilator for 10 days. I tell you, I was reminded of Aruna Shanbagh's case also. Mm -hmm. I telling you from my personal experience that it is not merely technical aspects, but it has lot to do with the emotions of the near and dear ones. It's an extremely hard decision for anyone who is so deeply attached with the person to take a decision that now the person is not going to live for a long time and therefore you take the life support system. I'm telling you, when my husband was on the ventilator, the doctors almost discreetly had expressed that uh, he is not going to uh, live. And therefore, they were telling my other uh, attendants that please do, uh, explain it to the judge that uh, she should take a decision. I mean, it's very, uh, I mean, I feel very uh, strange that this has happened. I decided as a judge and I was confronted with the situation of this nature in my personal life. And the first reaction which came to me that to, uh, to uh, let my husband live, I mean, be there as long as the life support, as long as his blood pressure is not falling, as long as his kidney is functioning. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to read all the literature, my children were uh, reading all the literature, how to make the person, you know, hoping against hope. So initially when you are confronted, because I'm telling you from my personal experience and not too long ago, I have not yet forgotten those very, very grueling days mm -hmm. in my memory. The first reaction for a, any attendant, forget about the doctors, because the doctors would think of the technical aspects, a, 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 a psychologist would think of the uh, psychological repercussions. Mm -hmm. But for the near and dear ones, the initial reaction is that let him or her live as long as he can. It's only when, I do not know what would have been my reaction if he had lived for several uh, several months or maybe more year but initial reaction is let him live let him live and we would take examples because in those days uh, i heard that one former minister priya ranjan das munshi perhaps he's also on the yeah. ventilator he's still being kept and yeah. i was i tell you from my experience i was just trying that if he is living on the ventilator let him also live this was my personal reaction. I do not know because, uh, because it's very difficult to digest that the person is not going to be there anymore. So the initial reaction of any attendant n near and dear ones is that let him live. But of course, over the years, what happens, of course, uh, you know, uh, 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 these, uh, these rational thinking starts seeping into the mind. Because I know of my real relative, uh, relative her mother was on the ventilator and after uh, six months or maybe a year, she was put off the ventilator. And I was arguing with the doctor that if she can be, she can revive even for, you know, that she was able to recognize her children and she could express her mind, why not in case of my husband? And then they, they had to be a little hard on me by uh, making me understand that no, his brain, which we call his brain dead, it is that. So there is absolutely zero chance of his survival. So these, I'm, from that I said it's no longer a legal problem for me. I can analyze things from the reaction of a near and dear one that what a person goes through.